Christian. And we have been looking for the past nine weeks at, uh, at some of the difficult things that Jesus said. Actually, it's taken us nine weeks. We've only had four messages so far. And uh, this is the fifth and final one in this series. And uh, we could probably go on and on because Jesus said so many things that are, that are difficult and hard. But we're going to end today by looking at Jesus' words in Matthew 18. Here Peter has a question for Jesus that we maybe wanted to ask ourselves. How many times do I have to forgive my brother or sister in Christ who does me wrong? And being the good disciple that he is, Peter suggests an answer. He says, as many as seven times? Should I forgive someone as many as seven times? And of course, we know the answer to that. No, not seven times. Seven times is way too many. At least that's the way we live, isn't it? Some of us live by a zero tolerance rule. One slip up and you're done. There's no forgiveness. Little kindergartner eats a, a graham cracker into the shape of a gun one time. And he's permanently expelled and sent to counseling and labeled a dangerous psychopath. And, and we shake our heads at, at such foolishness from others, but how many times do we operate from the zero tolerance rule in our own personal lives? If a neighbor or any church brother or sister or any family member crosses us even once, that's it. They're never forgiven. In terms of your relationship with them, it's a permanent no-fly list. Now, that's probably not usually the case. Most of us uh, are willing to grant a second chance. We live by, the, by that second chance rule. But that's all you get. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Second time, and we're done. There's no forgiveness. Some of us live by the second chance rule. But most of us probably live by some version of the baseball rule. Three strikes and you're out. Three times and you've proved yourself to be a total loser, so I'm not going to waste any further time or attention on you. We have nothing to do with you. So when Peter suggests that maybe he should forgive as much as seven times, he's already going way beyond the rules that we normally live by. And that's why we're almost dumbfounded when Jesus replies to him, no, not seven times, but 77 times. Or as some translations read, 70 times, seven times. It's the multiplication rule, not the baseball rule. Take the biggest amount of times that you can imagine and then multiply it by 11 or 70 or whatever number. It doesn't matter because the number is not important. It's all beyond our imagination. It's multiplication to absurdity. And that's just the point. If you're still counting, then you don't really get it. Forgiveness is not about counting offenses. It's about changing a relationship. It's about reconciliation. Listen to what Jesus taught just before those words that we read about forgiveness. He says, if your brother or sister sins against you, Go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you'll have won over your brother or sister. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And if they refuse to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, then treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Some call this the rule of Christ. It's how to put a relationship between Christians back together when one has sinned against another. Because that's what God wants. Our forgiveness is just a means to an end. Just like God's forgiveness of us. God didn't, didn't send Christ and give his life on the cross just so God could say, all right, I forgive you now. Get out of my face. No. No. Jesus came to bring us back into a life-changing relationship with God to reconcile us with our Heavenly Father. 
2 Corinthians 5.18 in the Bible says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus gives us this multiplication rule for forgiveness because what he really wants is reconciliation. He wants us back together. And that is so much harder, isn't it? And it's one thing to forgive somebody and just put it behind you. It's quite another thing to do the hard work of rebuilding the relationship. And it is hard work. That's why Jesus gives us a plan. In verse 15, he gives us step one. If your brother or sister sins against you, go to them. Go and talk. Go talk with them. One on one. Just between the two of you. Now before you go making up wild excuses why you can't do that, let me remind you that he's not saying that if somebody is beating you up, you should let them pummel you while you share your feelings with them. But let's face it, 99% of the Christians who hurt us aren't physically beating us up. In fact, most of them aren't even trying to hurt us. But they have hurt us by ignoring us, criticizing us, making us feel unworthy, by talking behind our backs or posting things about us on Facebook or disagreeing with us about something that is really important to us. In some way or another, we have been hurt in ways that don't threaten our physical safety. And what is Jesus' first rule? Go talk to them. And yet, isn't that often harder than even forgiving them? To actually talk with them? I told the story before, but it's still for me one of the, the best examples of how we live by our own rules rather than, than Christ's. Years ago, I was talking to a man in a nursing home. He was dying. And as we talked, he shared how he used to belong to my church and how he'd given up on church and on God a long time ago. I asked him what had happened, and he told me the, his story. As a young man, he'd lost his job, and he was embarrassed about it. He was embarrassed that he couldn't support his family. And so when the offering plate came around on, on Sunday morning, he conveniently excused himself to use the restroom so no one would notice that he didn't have anything to put in the plate. Well, the pastor had noticed, and as they were leaving the past, after the service and shaking hands, the pastor made a little joke. He said, I noticed you, you picked a real convenient time to use the restroom. Well, that comment really hurt that man. He was embarrassed. He was ashamed. He couldn't believe that the pastor would call attention to that. And so he went home angry and upset. And he waited for the pastor to apologize. Now, of course, the pastor didn't realize that, that he had hurt him. He didn't even know about the situation. And the guy never talked to the pastor. What he did was sit at home getting madder and madder. And then he started bad-mouthing the pastor, talking to his fellow church members about what a terrible pastor they had. When his friends didn't agree with them, then he got mad at them. And so he stopped talking to them too, and before long, he'd cut himself off from the pastor and from the church, and eventually from God. For 40 years, he lived without church or faith, only anger and hurt. When Jesus says to go and talk to the other person, that could have made all the difference. It could have been so different if he'd only taken that one step and talked to the person who had hurt him. Jesus says if we do that, we might win our brother or sister back. But we might not. Sometimes it takes more than a one-on-one to reconcile. And so Jesus provides a second step. In verse 16, he says, step two, Get somebody to help you. Bring one or two others along. Bring them into the conversation. Again, for the purpose of reconciliation. Don't be like the angry guy who brought two or three others into the conversation so they would take his side and agree with him how terrible the other person was. No, get them to get them to help to bring about reconciliation. Just a couple of verses after this in chapter 18, Jesus says, 
For I tell you where two or three come together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Go get a couple of others and in the name of Jesus come together and work towards reconciliation. And if that doesn't work, well, then there's step three, verse 17. Get even more involved. Get the whole church involved if you have to. Reconciliation is so important that it's not enough to say, well, we tried a couple of times and it didn't work, so what more can we do? And then finally, Jesus says, if you've gone to bat three times and struck out, if every attempt at reconciliation has been tried and failed, then he says there's step four. Treat the person as a pagan or a tax collector. And how does Jesus treat tax collectors and sinners? He does everything he can to win them back to God. Jesus doesn't stop doing what's right. Not after three strikes, not after seven attempts, not even after 77 or seven times, 70 times. Jesus keeps doing what's right. Jesus keeps trying to reconcile us to God and to each other. And he calls us to do the same, to have the ministry of reconciliation. That's hard. It's really hard. We can hardly believe that he tells us to do it. But we are called to never give up doing what's right. Not even if it takes us seven times, 70 times. Now as for that man that, uh, that I talked about there at the nursing home, in the months before he died, he did reconcile with God and with the church that he'd rejected for so long. And, and it was a beautiful thing. Man, I think he had the best three months of his life while he was dying. My only regret is all those wasted years because he followed his own rules, not Christ's. My only regret is that it didn't happen 40 years earlier. This isn't baseball. When we've tried and tried again, Jesus says, then try some more. Seven times, 77 times, seven times, 70 times. Never get up. Never give up doing what's right. Never, ever give up. Amen.